Electricast. Cars say a lot about who we are. It represents freedom for a lot of people. This season on Drive, I'm going to talk to all sorts of different people. I looked at car names. Yes. A- and yes. I found all the car names that have science or astronomically it's inspired. It's crazy. It's huge. It is. Okay, yes, sure. I happen to be CEO of Ford Motor Company. For me, it's all about cars, movement, and our mutual passion for things that get us around. This is Drive, and I'm Jim Farley. This episode is brought to you by Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. In breaking news, leading scientists worldwide are conducting experiments to determine if Reese's Peanut Butter Cups are the perfect combination of peanut butter and chocolate. However, it appears the study was inconclusive, as the scientists couldn't help but eat all the Reese's. Because when you want something sweet, you can't do better than Reese's. Find Reese's now at a store near you. Hold on to your butts. We are changing the course of history as we see it. That is what Wesker demands. Now this affects Iris. Um, Iris, where are you? What you feel only matters to you. I do not entertain hypotheticals. The world as it is is vexing enough. Iris, I have a tip for you. Don't take drugs! Or whatever movies with Wesley and Iris. What up and welcome to Or Whatever Movies. I'm your co-host, Iris, and I'm here with my older brother, Wesley. And today we're talking a movie from 1991, available nowhere, Doyle. (laughs) No, Dale. Dale. No. Danny? Darren. Oh, (laughs) Daryl. Nobody knows what we're talking about because no one has seen this movie. And that movie is specifically Dutch. I mean, people have seen it. There is a small fan base, but not enough to justify apparently the revenue that it would generate were it to be put on any streaming service anywhere. You can't even like buy it on iTunes, like a dusty record in the back of the store. So then how do you justify suggesting this is our Thanksgiving fair? Well, because I remember it as a Thanksgiving fair at the time. I wanted it to be a companion to last year's Thanksgiving focus, which was planes, trains and automobiles. Also by John Hughes. It was a travelogue movie between two guys trying to get home for Thanksgiving. Whereas Dutch 1991 is a travelogue movie about two guys trying to get home for Thanksgiving. I see the distinction. (laughs) (laughs) Also directed by John Hughes. (laughs) No, this was not directed by John Hughes. It was written by John Hughes. So, yeah, and that I think that's the only distinction here is that one was written and directed and one was just written. Yeah, it feels like a John Hughes movie in a weird sense, I suppose, but I actually didn't. It's so close to Planes, Trains and Automobiles and John Hughes's oeuvre that I didn't realize or didn't remember until this moment that he didn't direct it. Peter Feynman directed Dutch oh, for whatever Peter reason. Feynman. <laughs> Good old Pete. <laughs> Also known for Crocodile Dundee. Oh, man. Well, that's some pedigree, man. For Are you kidding? For the late 80s, early 90s, that's some cachet. Yeah, Crocodile Dundee. I remember that being a, like right up there with Action Jackson in terms of our VHS rotation. Massive hit. Uh, so Australian director directing a distinctly Americana road trip Thanksgiving movie. Yep. Um, well, I have to say, Brian was actually really mad at you for this one. <laughs> Brian seems to be mad at me for many of them lately. He was mildly annoyed. No, he was probably more than mildly annoyed with the people under the stairs. But with Dutch, he was like, this is a waste of your time. And I was like, (laughs) listen, bro, you can go and do something else. And he was like, fine. So he like goes into the kitchen. He's like shuffling around. And then he comes back and watches periodically. Exactly. And I'm like, he's been awfully quiet for like the last five minutes. And I'm like. (laughs) You look up and he's like over the bar watching. (laughs) Exactly. He's totally sucked in. But then he's just mad about it. He's like, why is that kid so insufferable? You know, that's the consensus. Had you ever seen or even heard of Dutch? Well, I'm very familiar with Ed O'Neill. I watched probably, what, five, six years of Married with Children. I never got into Modern Family. So I, I felt like I knew Dutch. But as I watched Dutch, I was like, yep, nope, never seen this. <laughs> I did watch Modern Family. I was dragged into it by Kelly Ray. And all around, it's a good ensemble show. Pretty, really strong. I still think the legendary Ed O'Neill is uh, is the star of that show. But he plays a little bit of a tired Al Bundy role, albeit a much more successful kind of guy. But in a weird way, Dutch 
even with all his nothing burps better than bacon, corduroy, every man, stupid winter hat, kind of unshaven, lotion in the mouth kind of vibe, this is Ed <laughs> O'Neill more refined than I had ever seen him before. Like when he's in his jacket and talking about his construction business and stuff, and he's all like bright faced and stuff at some elegant party. I was like, whoa, because he <laughs> plays a Al Bundy ish type role, except when he's not. So you're saying that he cleaned up nice? That's the Dutch character, but he starts out all refined. Yeah. He's just a working class guy who became wildly successful. I think Dutch is just beleaguered. By what, though, other than, by what or whom other than Doyle? Uh, well, there are a hundred ways to escape your redneck past, but he hasn't found all of them yet. <laughs> that was a Ben Folds reference, by the way. So Dutch, Dutch seems to have it pretty well together, and he also seems to be fairly self-aware. Like, he knows that he, when given a chance, can be a very likable guy and a convincing guy. And before he sets off on his road trip to retrieve Doyle, he calls into the business. He lets his colleagues know he's going to be out of pocket. He's got people to command. He's got people that report to him and that, you know, he needs to alert as to his absence. Like, he seems like he's got it together. And he he's also calculating, right? He has money in his wallet. He's intending to give Doyle a certain kind of road trip experience. I don't think he's calculated enough to purposely have let the prostitutes hoodwink them. <laughs> but maybe, maybe that could have been part of his plan. No, I do think that he was taken advantage of. Are you sure, though, because that was the bottom, right, where he was like, all right, screw you. I'm giving up on you. Like, that was the point where he needed to go in order for Doyle to have his turn. Like, it's possible that could have been calculated. Mm, like down. <laughs> you think that he knew that they, the, the hooker was going to try to lotion the ring off his finger? <laughs> OK, because I mean, does he sleep that hard? I will acknowledge that there is something to the, hey, guys on a road trip got to look out for themselves. This is a coming of age life, not lesson, but like, you know, every boy should be stuck in the back seat in a Camaro in the wintertime with a with a hooker, you know, <laughs> kind of like I know nothing is going to happen, but it's still like a rite of passage vibe. Well, I would probably be like whatever you think there, except the fact that the most touching moment between Dutch and Doyle is when Doyle, did I hear it correctly? Did Doyle admit that he was horny? Yep. And he let himself get excited. Yep. And then Dutch is like tear in the eye, like holding back emotions, proud of Doyle for that moment. A hundred percent. That's a dude code thing. This is not something that you are likely going to have to deal with with two girls with Brian and stuff. But dad would always like sex is a weird thing. It's like a father son fostering thing, like putting a, your kid in the backseat with a hooker. There have definitely been I think it was like Michael Jackson or something where he talked about his dad getting like prostitutes for him and his brothers and stuff. And that was like his first experiences. But dad what? would always go to Vegas and go to the junk souvenir shop and would always bring me back that little box and it says horny toad on the top a little baby crate and you open it and there's like a little rubber toad in there with a giant boner what yeah it's a dude thing for sure <laughs> it's, it's like dudes it, checking out uh their boys junk when they're born and being like all like ooh, it's big <laughs> That's so weird. I do remember one Christmas where you got a deck of nudie cards. Yep, nudie cards were a constant from mom and dad coming back from Vegas. I think it was the guilt of leaving us with grandma. It's a weird like father son, yeah, go get him son kind of thing. Okay. I, I think it, I think it, it is pretty innocent. Like there's nothing weird about it because I think it's universal. But this just could be me speaking from a place of trauma where I assumed it was normal and it didn't happen to anybody else. Except with dad and Dutch. <laughs> Wait, so how calculated was Dutch then? Did he even, was he even putting on the pathetic show for the two call girls as they called themselves? No, I don't think he was that smart. I think he was polished trash. And I think with that comes an inherent morality uh, that's, you know, suspect. He can stand up to his new girlfriend's ex-husband who seems to decide that he's powerful because he has money but at the same time he's totally at ease among the hapless people that they meet on the road trip the hookers and the shelter family that he tries to help out and he's you know this movie is called dutch well if dutch isn't likable is doyle certainly less likable like enough to annoy brian right off the bat and brian's from ohio <laughs> 
<laughs> was that a Midwest reference? Because Doyle's from Chicago? I'm saying that's just a like big jacket, gloves attached to your jacket, beanie with a fuzzy ball on the top kind of camaraderie. No? Oh, like he, well, I mean, he never liked that. And he <sighs> wanted to get away from the fuzzy jacket. He wanted to get away from the big jacket hat thing as quickly as possible. Does it exist in your home? Yes, because he won't let it go. He's like, you never know when you might need that. This is what I'm saying in case the blizzard comes through Woodland Hills. Right. It's right. It's like packed with the ice pick where it's like, you never know. This is the, this is the difference between life and death sometimes. I don't know, man. It's a, I mean, I, I don't know that I would call this a family movie. Maybe in the in the 80s. But nowadays, uh, well, apparently not because it's not available anywhere. And maybe most families don't know how to access it. But there is a, you know, kind of a fuzzy, non-threatening vibe to this movie, at least the way I regard it. Let's talk about Mr. Standish. So big year for Christopher McDonald. Christopher McDonald's the man. I think I referenced this in another review. I referenced Dutch and you were like, what? And then I had yeah, to go seek in, out the DVD. In Thelma and Louise. Man, same year. Great year. I mean, why is he, is Christopher McDonald just synonymous with douchebag dudes? Is this basically just the next evolution of Daryl? Like if Daryl did get promoted to district manager, then he would become Reed Standish? Absolutely. (laughs) What what does Gina Davis say about Daryl's ass? Oh, he said you can park a car in the shadow of his ass. (laughs) I don't know that Christopher McDonald has a particularly large ass. Maybe it's plump or whatever, but he's not like a big dude. He's like in pretty good shape. Yeah, I I think that there there had to have been something about just insulting people's asses. Yeah, but also anybody's going to have a big ass next to like 20-year-old Brad Pitt. That's true. (laughs) Would you say that Reed Standish is the villain of this film? Absolutely. I mean, if we're breaking it down to conflicts or whatever, the primary conflict is whether or not they can get home, which, of course, we know in a John Hughes Thanksgiving road trip comedy they're going to do. And I bet you those guys who hate each other are going to be friends in the end. But definitely he is the looming problem. He is the epitome of fatherhood as far as young Doyle is concerned. And therefore, he is distrustful of anyone. Doesn't give Dutch a fair shake. And it's really only Dutch's tenacity and bad luck, I guess, that has helps him win over Doyle in the end because he's a good person whereas Mr. Standish Doyle's dad is not and so good people in the end still believe in consequences which is the message of Dutch's punch in the face and shot in the butt yeah right like a good person's not going to let Doyle get away without getting shot in the butt even if he has to shoot him in front of his mother it's an 80s dad good person. Like, I think dad's a good person, but he definitely scared the bejesus out of me. And had we had, uh, <laughs> you know, actually, I had a paintball gun. I don't think he ever shot me with it. Did he ever shoot you with your own BB gun? I'm not sure if dads are allowed to be like this anymore. But yeah, shooting him in the butt is definitely like so much so that, that, I, that I, don't, I don't even think he and Doyle's mom even had an argument about it. Right. She's laughing and then she's scared, but then she knows what has to happen. What has to come to pass? I'm pretty sure that if I picked up a BB gun and shot Rebecca in the ass, I'd be out of this house. Really? I'm pretty sure. Like, it's not... Plus, it's a, it's a little bit different. In a weird way, isn't it better that he shoots, like, 13-year-old Doyle in the ass versus me shooting nearly 23-year-old Rebecca in the ass? Um, Somehow. Is it just a dude thing? It's a dude thing. It's a generational thing. It's, it's a gender thing. It's an age thing. <laughs> All of it. Yeah. So Ed O'Neill, kind of an interesting choice, casting choice for Dutch. And yet not at all. I feel like this is a very specific Dutch that only Ed O'Neill could do. Is Dutch supposed to be charming? Is he supposed to be likable? Yes. And is he supposed to be attractive? I don't know about attractive, although he cleans up pretty well. He's got like sparkling blue or green or blue green eyes. I'm not sure. But no, once he, he's supposed to be all bacon burpee and split pants and, and a strange amount of corduroy. But he is meant to be likable. We're supposed to like him. And he's like, Doyle? And he's like all excited and confidently telling, trying to impress his woman and saying, you know, I'm going to make friends. We're going to be besties and stuff. And then it all goes awry. But he still wants to like do the stuff and get fireworks at a roadside thing. That's like a pure dad kind of thing. You feel like there are similarities between Dutch and our dad? I can see what his intention is for sure. First of all, there's the trying to be a good dude to like single mom type thing that I that I like. 
I, I don't think, I think it's more effective if he's trying to impress both his fiance or girlfriend or whatever, or Doyle's mom, uh, and also Doyle himself, because dads don't really feel the need to impress their sons. Until they get to kind of an older age, I don't think. Whereas he has to make a good impression and win over this hard-ass kid who's spoiled to death by his dad. So he's always trying to do the right thing, to impart life lessons. But his life lessons were totally different. Like, his life lessons were nose-mashed and left-for-dead fight aesthetic. That he knows that Doyle <laughs> hopes Doyle will never have to go through. But it's much more hard-edged, grown-up, you know, tough-living kind of thing. So it, it's both a lesson trying to impress him and also trying to break this porcelain shell that Doyle has up. Well, he certainly doesn't have to teach Doyle how to defend himself. Nope. Is Dutch supposed to be funny? Did you laugh? Did I laugh? I don't remember. I was a kid. I thought it was Al Bundy in a different movie. And I was like, wait, he's wearing a suit. I don't like it. But then when we get into the Al Bundy-ness of it, then I could appreciate it more. I mean, I guess I wasn't totally a kid. I was like 15 or whatever, but that was that's like prime married with children age. Did I laugh? I don't know. Did I, but I never saw planes, trains, and automobiles. Really, I mean, it wasn't. It wasn't the like, oh, that's a Thanksgiving movie. It's a, it's a classic. Any more than a Christmas story really was for me. Did I see it? Yes. As an adult, do I? Is it like a requirement? No. And neither was planes, trains, and automobiles. So in a weird way, I, I was fiercely defensive of this movie, and I was like, Dutch? No, Dutch is the. John Hughes Thanksgiving road trip movie. What is this planes, trains, and automobiles? But I'm in the minority. Nobody cares because nobody watches this movie. It's just Dutch has kind of always been there for me for Thanksgiving. Is it funny? I don't know. That's what you're here for. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. This episode is brought to you by Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. In breaking news, leading scientists worldwide are conducting experiments to determine if Reese's Peanut Butter Cups are the perfect combination of peanut butter and chocolate. However, it appears the study was inconclusive, as the scientists couldn't help but eat all the Reese's. Because when you want something sweet, you can't do better than Reese's. Find Reese's now at a store near you. It's certainly supposed to be funny, and I really wanted to like it, but I, I only laughed twice, and the first time was when he's all paternal, and he's cooking, and he's got the apron on, and he's, like, butchering the chicken and rough chopping the veggies and, like, all throwing them in a bowl and topping them with butter and stuff, and then they transition from that to the restaurant <laughs> scene. <laughs> I wasn't exactly sure why that was funny or what it was meant to communicate, but it was it was surprising and probably more of a credit to the director than anything. Well, Dutch isn't he's uh, he tries hard and he tries to be in that world, but it's not really his place. Like split dicking a chicken and like making it all fancy or whatever. It just doesn't come naturally to Dutch. And and he can be flexible and humble enough to say, yeah, this didn't work out. Let's go out to dinner. Like his happiness and all his good food is all paid for because that's what he can do now. Um, it's weird that you say that because Ed O'Neill said that that was his best memory of Dutch. He said the kid was good. The Ethan Embry was named Ethan Randall at the time. But he remembers hanging out with Joe Beth Williams in the kitchen and totally improvising a cooking scene. They knew their dialogue. And he's like, yeah, Dutch is cooking <laughs> in the middle of it. And they're just like throwing food around and laughing. And it's like <laughs> dumb. And like, they don't know what they're doing. It doesn't have. So it makes sense that it would be like a, they're going to end up at a restaurant anyway. Right. But there was something familiar, casual and likable about their about their dynamic, which I think really cemented or like it sealed the deal for me that, that he had great intentions for this woman and that they had a potential to be good mates. The second scene where I laughed was when he put <laughs> for some reason he like takes off the jacket to do the no, he is wearing the jacket. He takes off the jacket to snuff out the smoldering fireworks. That's right. And then the fireworks shoot through his jacket. And then instead of abandoning the whole thing, he puts on the smoldering jacket. That is like it's sending off billows of smoke in the frigid November air. 
And then he like pulls it snug around himself and the, the feathers puff out the back. And then he gets into the car and you know it's improvised because the, one of the feathers lands in his mouth. <laughs> and it kind of ironically foreshadows the whole lotion physical comedy, but he he goes, <laughs> and he spits out the feather that landed in his mouth, and it just happens to attach to the windshield. <laughs> See, so you dumb. Can't, so you can't help it. And it, again, it has nothing to do with like the skill or the plot of the movie. Although I would say it has to do with the skill of Ed O'Neill. Who I think is a comic genius for our time, the the like really? good every every man kind of dude, and I and I like him a tremendous amount. He was always good in Modern Family too. You should give it another shot. I don't but, remember him being so gumby and stretchy. His face is like stretchy clay. In a way, I think he is like Steve Martin and John Candy, kind of put together in a single entity from Planes, Trains, and Automobiles for this movie. He's kind of both the luggish, hapless kind of dude and also the, the more shrewd, calculating one who's just beset by the in, the uh, inanity of the situation. Hmm. And both of these movies, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles and Dutch, have some pretty hairy things happening. It's not like Dutch is a boring, talky movie. There's car crashes and near murder. The fireworks, you know, that's a very dad kind of thing. But even as a 15-year-old or whatever, when I first saw Dutch, I never related to the Dutch character. I guess I would more in adulthood, but I was always firmly in Doyle's camp. Like, I related to the kid more, and I remember, like, the situations of, like, being in... Well, actually, I don't remember because I wasn't in them, but I can understand the sentiment the filmmakers had of this rite of passage of suddenly find yourself in a car with hookers and don't tell your mom and kind of thing. But boy, when he is serious and he's like, one more to throw, one more and I'm leaving. And then he leaves and it's like, see you at the motel about 50 miles down the road. And then for the, for the movie purposes, he does just that. He pieces out and leaves the kid in the tundra. Like the kid doesn't even know for sure which motel it is. Is it the first motel he comes to? Does he kick open a random door and is just lucky that Dutch is in there in his underwear? <laughs> he actually leaves the kid in the winter wonderland. Are you saying this is inadvisable? I'm saying that this movie goes hard in some respects with the the car crash and stuff and the kid like he put he really did put that trucker's life in danger but as revenge for leaving him 50 miles down the road in sub-zero temperatures because I get it the kid maybe is a good egg underneath and he's just got this hard exterior on him put in place by his negligent dad but also he is a kid could you imagine leaving a kid on the side of the road and then like actually trucking off to the hotel? He's periodically checking out the window, but also that kid could be dead. So when Married with Children hit the air, that had to have been what? Married with Children was what, 87? Yeah. Wow. Good job. Um, it definitely challenged the family sitcom and it was just always on in our house. And maybe there was a, like a Chicago connection and stuff with dad. But like we watched Married with Children I never questioned it. And then I found out later from friends that they were family situations where p parents did not allow their children to watch Married with Children. It was considered to be, it was considered trashy or it was considered inappropriate, an overly mature family drama, which was surprising to me, but I guess it shouldn't have been considering there were zero filters, there were zero censorship in our house. Anyway, what I'm saying is Married with Children was a little, I guess, progressive, maybe notoriously so. But was Dutch intended to be a little racy, a little mature, and a little bit pushing the boundaries of what a, a father-son type dynamic and road trip movie should could be like? Yeah, I think so. And in a weird way, this is like a forgotten or a lost. If there is a lost or forgotten John Hughes movie, this is definitely it. It didn't do terribly well at the box office. It kind of got swept under the rug or whatever, but people remember it in certain respects, John Hughes fans in particular. But Married with Children, yeah, to your point, 1987 Fox was the first big network to actually try to gain a footing in viewership. They had the big three in ABC, CBS, and NBC, and then all of a sudden Fox comes along and they want to do it. And so they're looking for something unconventional, something risky to stand out from the typical family sitcom. Married with Children is it, and uh, yeah, very controversial. And then The Simpsons, those are those were the two anchors. And Bart Simpson shirts, I don't know, you were probably too young, but they were in middle school. They were banned when we were in sixth grade. 
Bart Simpson Eat Underachiever. My Eat My Shorts. Yeah. Those t-shirts were banned in our middle school. And this was like planes, trains, and automobiles. They didn't really get into racy, like hookery situations. Uh, whereas Dutch did for a 13-year-old kid, for an unconventional father figure type. So I think it tried. I still think that this is closer to family fair, especially in the age we live in now. So I don't think that it was banned or forgotten because it was too racy or risky for a Thanksgiving comedy. I just think it was a hard blow for John Hughes, who was actually coming off this massive string and then started to falter. And the 90s were a really hard decade for him. And so maybe the shtick was wearing a little bit thin. Maybe he was the Joss Whedon of his time where he's edgy. And then people later on decided maybe he's just kind of a jerk. I don't know enough about John Hughes, the man... I mean, Molly Ringwald, they had fall, he had falling outs with a lot of the Brat Pack. And Molly Ringwald said that he was kind of, you know, not a cool dude or whatever. And that was the reason that they fell out. He and Anthony Michael Hall had a thing. So I don't know that Dutch is evidence of any of this stuff coming to pass. But but it makes sense, right? It's John Hughes's shtick, or at least part of it, was portraying kids as the angsty, misbehaved kids, how they really are. This is an 80s kids Thanksgiving movie. Set in 1991. Yeah. (laughs) And we've got kids of all ages, right? We've got the Dutch character, who's apparently a high-functioning adult, but has a childlike spirit, a childlike heart. And then this kid or whatever, who basically never got to be a kid as a way to protect himself from getting hurt from his dad. Consider the granddaddy of all roguish kids holiday movies. Home Alone was only a year before. And a decidedly more family-friendly film. Yeah, but even though there was like torture and murder and all kinds of stuff in Home Alone and, and serial killers. Okay, so who is this episode for? I don't know. It's for me and the three people who remember Dutch and remember enough about Dutch to understand what we're talking about when we're referencing scenes that are on YouTube, but the entire movie, you actually have to seek it out or bust out your VHS. You mean DVD? Well, yeah, you can get it on DVD, but not, I mean, it was never issued on Blu-ray. It's not available to stream. It may be one day. Never say never, because now, of all things, True Lies wasn't released anywhere because it wasn't optimized. James Cameron never got around to it because he was working on the, the avatars, and now True Lies is streaming. Maybe one day we'll get Dutch back on a streaming service and it will pick up steam in a kind of retro nostalgia way because everyone's still stuck in the 80s and when we land firmly in the 90s decade when flannel comes back and stuff maybe dutch will be a runaway streaming hit for paloma yep and a sleeper episode here at or whatever movies and your final reading is i don't know (laughs) dutch is for the 15 year old in me or whatever when i'm much more closely associated with that character I can't say that it's bad. I think I gave Planes, Trains, and Automobiles an all right. But Dutch is fun and part of my childhood and a holiday movie for people who don't like holidays necessarily. I tend to check out for the year right after Halloween and I suffer through Thanksgiving and Christmas and all the stress that it brings. And this is the not stressful kind of thing where you don't have to deal with parents and you just have to deal with the one schlubby dude and... Doyle's not exactly stressed out by Dutch, but uh, maybe the other way around. And they have fun and adventures, and there's some boobies. Implied boobies. Fur co- fur-covered fur boobies. And and it's like, Drool-covered you know, boobies. And I can appreciate the turn. I'm not sure that it's necessarily believable, but it's fantastic in its heightened demonstration of situations that a father figure and a child figure would, be, would find themselves in. I think Dutch is fun, and I wanted it to review it for a part of our Thanksgiving series, you know, because it's not the one that people think of. We're going off canon for these ones. Name another. What's another Thanksgiving movie that we can possibly go to? Why not Dutch? I don't know, man. I'll give it an all right rating. All right. I think Dutch was fine. It's an important movie to see if you're an Ed O'Neill fan. It's necessary, obviously, if you're a John Hughes fan. It was hilarious to see Daryl make a reappearance, the Christopher McDonald character. Ultimately, I think that Dutch is maybe like Action Jackson, maybe? An 80s movie that was really close to me and then doesn't have any real application in modern times. Yeah, maybe there's a reason that these movies get lost in the shuffle. Maybe there's a reason that Dutch isn't a beloved Thanksgiving or holiday movie that people return to year after year. Although I'm sure there's some that are. And those are probably, not to be super genderist, dudes. 
And <laughs> as a non-dude, uh, as a non-dude, I don't think Dutch is for me. And so, though I don't really have anything against the movie, I do give Dutch a boring. Man. And that's a review on Dutch. And all right from Wes, a boring from Iris. For those of you who have not seen Dutch, hit up Wes, 818-835-0473 or whatever movies at gmail.com. You have the DVD copy. To borrow our DVD copy. Or maybe should we rent it and then we can give proceeds to like the shelter. We, yeah, we can sign it, each sign it and auction it off. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Get our prize DVD copy of Dutch signed by yours truly, Iris and Wesley. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to our podcast. Please give us a five star rating. Please support us on Patreon. Please follow us on Instagram. All of these things help people find or whatever movies. Thanks for listening. Happy Thanksgiving. And we'll see you next time. Today is working for me. Do you believe that for yourself? Hey, I'm Pastor Julie, and I want to empower you through encouragement, inviting you to my podcast, Big Truth Encouragement, where I unpack living a faith-filled life. I created my podcast for the ladies, but gentlemen, you'll gain something too. So I invite you to listen to Big Truth Encouragement on Electricast and any platform where you listen to your podcast. Electricast. Welcome to Ringside with Ray and Prince. My name is Ray Leonard Jr. Oh, is that the chair? No, that's just my dad. My name is Prince Daniels Jr. Daniels again with a big hole. On this show, we come to humanize athletes, entertainers, business executives. We're going to see what makes them tick. Tuesdays, 10 a.m. Pacific time on Spotify, Apple, Amazon, and wherever you get your podcasts. We'll see you there. Peace and power. Electric acid. Electric acid.